And just remember, as difficult as all those guitar parts are, <laughs> on a smaller neck with smaller frets, my young is doubling them on a bigger neck with bigger frets and this wide six string neck. <laughs> What's up, guys? Welcome back to Lowen University. Today, we're checking out The Glass Prison, which won your vote in a poll I posted a couple days ago for more Dream Theater. This track is from their album Six Degrees of Inner Turbulence, released in 2002. Such a great era of the band, just banger after banger. We're going to be checking out a live version today. But before we get started, I've got a little surprise for all of you that have been asking. Making the debut in the video, the six-string Warwick Thumb. For Glass Prison, Six String, John Myung, it had to be this bass. But let's get into it. The Glass Prison, live from Dream Theater. It's one of my favorite bass intros ever. Grabbing that harmonic fast. All the way down to the fourth fret. Man, I miss this era. Short hair Petrucci, Mike Portnoy, long hair Rudis. This was such a good build. This is back in the John Mayung Yamaha version for his signature bases back then. Listen how loud that bass is. This is going to be fun. Just punching. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about that signature bass intro real quick. Keeps the melody. Dream Theater always notorious for their cool John Myung bass intros. And that's the reason I got the six string out for this video. You gotta play this on the six string. So he's grabbing this fourth fret harmonic to start it off. Open B string, doing a little melody up there, which becomes the riff, of course. So you gotta make this eight fret jump and grab that quick. But the question I've always had about this riff is, it, it's aligning with that bell. Obviously, this is a meta album concept where all the albums were kind of linked together for a bit there in that era. And the, the sizzle of the radio static comes out from Finally Free into this song, which opens the album. But that bell is the first thing you hear, I'm assuming, played by Rudis. But I always wondered, did the harmonic come first or did the bell come first? Because it fits so perfectly. It's not one of those things where John would go, let me just add a harmonic here. So if the bell came first, then that harmonic was a really cool way to add some texture to the bass part. Also, this beat drop coming up is the best beat drop in prog metal, in my opinion. I just love the way that hits. It's so good. So let's keep going. Love the wah. Listen to the bass again. It's just so chewy. Look how epic Myung's hair is there. Nice. So this is kind of why I wanted to see the live version, to see how he's kind of playing some of this stuff. I want you to watch how he plucks very specifically over the pickup. This is something Billy Sheehan does and talks about a lot. Uh, kind of gives you just a, a sense of reference point when you're kind of playing uh, just to really dig into the string evenly because when you're playing these low notes on the low strings that are just really kind of clanking along, it kind of helps you to keep them even. Something Billy Sheehan talks about a lot. You can watch it right here. Man, he is hitting those strings. Watch his fingers right here. He's very strictly staying over those pickups.
Are they going to show the solo? Oh, come on. Well, I get to see more John my own. Woo! I guess they're not going to show it. That's okay. Staying over that pickup. This is an onslaught of stamina. I mean, this song is 13 minutes. There's a lot of fast gallops. And, you know, this was always like the benchmark. I, I remember trying to learn this song a long time ago. And it's like, if I can get through the end of the song without feeling my forearms are on fire, then I'm getting somewhere, right? So let's go back and catch this riff under the solo. The time signature change is going on. There's a little 2 4 tag happening. That epic hair. Pretty cool. So it's like 4 4 with a little 2 4 tag. Really interesting how they just decide to put that in there. And I imagine it makes soloing over this even a little bit weird. You got to remember that coming up. You have to write a solo, but it kind of adds a little bit of room for him to make those key changes. So speaking of the key changes, we're kind of in a B minor this entire time. It's a really interesting riff. It kind of has some chromaticism to it. And the whole thing is kind of based around B minor. So going to this chug part really slow. And then it kind of goes up a whole major, or I'm sorry, minor third interval to this D minor shape. And you kind of hear that key change, the tonality changes. And then it goes down to sort of like a C sharp diminished. I'm just going to say C sharp minor for the sake of this riff. So anyway, really big stretches on the fretting hand and John has to play those fast gallops. It's just a lot. And I have a feeling Petrucci overdubbed this for a bootleg. Maybe, maybe did, maybe didn't. But bands do that. And it's okay if you do. Whatever. You want the you want the performance to look cool. Okay, last thing about this solo, then we'll move on and let it play a bit. The, so, the genius of these arpeggios and the solo is really interesting. I was looking at the guitar tablature for this solo before this video because it's something I always thought about and I kind of wanted to confirm it. So without getting too heady here into the theory, the riff starts out in B minors I just talked about. Let me play it up an octave so you can hear it better. So then it goes up to um, that little key change there up to D minor. So he starts the solo out, and you're just going to have to trust me on this because I looked at the tab. The arpeggios go, and that second one is a C sharp diminished, which naturally resolves to D minor. So it's almost like foreshadowing that upcoming D minor riff. And I find that super cool because... When it goes to the D minor part, it changes to a D minor arpeggio, and the second arpeggio is again a C sharp diminished. So the C sharp diminished, they always resolve to a D minor. It's really, really cool, and I'm sure that was a conscious thing Petrucci did because that solo is full of inversions going down chromatically, lots of diminished, but he's taking, like I saw like a, an E minor in there with a G in the bass, but it kind of went chromatically down. It kind of gives this just just gliding motion, just flowing through the chord progressions. And it's, I can understand why it would be hard to play too. Let's keep going. And this port noise backing vocals a lot. There's that key change up to D minor. Back to C sharp. But in the key of B minor, right? I find it interesting that my young plays open D string to that B. 
-hmm. versus going. You could tell he is just hitting those strings so hard. Now Jordan's doing the same thing on keyboard, the guitar solo. Same arpeggio. Love the feel change, it's so groovy and kind of keep change again. They keep that thing going. Really good writing. Man, my young is just such a badass. Look at the leather pants, just. <laughs> nice little live impro improv there. This is the last slow break they're going to have in the song because it just goes up from here. I'm going to point out real quick, too, they're now going C to B. Instead of keeping it in the B minor diatonically, they could have just done... They're going... Kind of like that Pantera influenced. I remember Mike Portnoy talking about this in some old documentary. This was an era uh, they were really into this band. So that's kind of like a walk by Pantera sort of sort of kind of thing. Dream Theater were you know never shy about their influences, and I've always really liked that about them. <laughs> DJ scratching sounds. And the song just goes like this. We're just going to keep going. That's a beast of a riff. I just love how loud the bass is. You can just really hear every note. So before we keep going into this section, I want you to listen to something about Mike Portnoy that I have just always loved about him as a drummer. Throughout this middle section of the song, Mike Portnoy does so many sneaky things with drum parts. He flips the beat, he'll put the snare in a different spot, but he never loses the groove. And that's something that I cannot stress enough about him as a drummer and why he's one of my favorites from way back when is that no matter how complicated Dream Theater's music got, he was able to make it groove. You could, there could be 9-8, 7-8 with a you know 5-16 tag or something, and he found a way to always make it groove. It's like, you know, 
you know the old saying, there's a hundred drum beats for any riff. I think Mike Portnoy always chose the best beat out of those hundred. I just feel like when I listen back to this older stuff that he played on, there was just something about every riff was just like the right drum beat, the right hit, the right fill. And he was able to sneak in these like really ear candy fills with a lot of embellishment that were always just so tasteful. I mean, you just can't deny these early Dream Theater records and his contribution to it, not only as a producer and a writer, but just the, the simple drumming parts were just perfectly done. And I'm not here to have an entire Mangini versus Portnoy debate. Um, I, I love what Mangini's done in the band too, but this is just something I've always known to be true about him because when I listened to his future projects, the Winery Dogs, Transatlantic, Sons of Apollo, I saw it on tour with him when I toured with Sons of Apollo, is that he is just has a knack and a gift for always playing the most appropriate drum part no matter how technical it is. And I have to give that to him. But this next section, you're going to hear that he'll flip the beat, but it's so smooth. And if you're not listening for it, you won't hear it. So pay attention. Put the snare here right now. Now, wait for it to come back the second time. You'll see it's a little different. Petrucci! Doing that? Whoa! I've never seen that in my life. I got to go back and see that. I've never seen Petrucci do like a harsh backup vocal. Has this happened more often? Where have I been? <laughs> I love that so much. Yes. <laughs> I don't know why I'm so tickled by that. Martial arts here. Nice. Hey. Love James's energy back then. I'm loving this. And I wish they played this song live more. It's it's a lot of fun. Standard beat here. This is the Mike Portnoy thing. Just a little variation on it. Sneaks in something different. He sneaks in something different, just a different way to kind of feel it, but he's doing it more often than you think in these sections, kind of flipping the riff, you know, I love it, I love it, and it's kind of something musicians would only notice, but maybe now you can't unhear it now that I've shown it to you. Uh, I was hoping they're going to show my own play that part. So we're nine minutes into this. And just remember, as difficult as all those guitar parts are, <laughs> on a smaller neck with smaller frets, my young is doubling them on a bigger neck with bigger frets and this wide six-string neck. I mean, you got to really think about the stamina it takes to do that. And with as loud as the bass is in this mix, I can, I can hear that he's nailing it right on it. I love this... Uh, riff here i think he taps it on the recording the studio version it really sounds like he's kind of doing the a little faster but i couldn't see it here i was kind of hoping to see that i'll have to go look at another live performance but there's not many on youtube and i'm really glad i found this one because this one sounds and looks a lot better than that other one from around this time period but this is where 
the ascent happens. It is constant barrage of technicality and 16th notes. I just got done saying the stamina he had to have to make it this far, and it's about to get even crazier. It really just blows my mind when I think about it. So let's keep going. So fast. Key change. Maybe guitar players can tell me this. Petrucci does that a lot. When I've watched live Dream Theater videos, he'll do this thing where he like m just moves the pick around his fingers. That's a perfect example of it right there. Maybe you can tell me what that is because I've never really seen him talk about that. Right here. It's interesting. Woo, look at him go. Real quick, I talked about in the Sean Malone video, Sean Malone was the master of no wasted motion. Truthfully, I think John Myung's playing is a lot of wasted motion. But early on, I thought it looked so cool. It just looked like he was ripping it. It was just a lot to look at. And I always think about that. There's really no right or wrong way to play. You can play really consistent with a lot of efficiency and no wasted motion. Or you can have a style like this where maybe your fingers come off a little bit and you're kind of exaggerating the movements. Or maybe you have to because of the width of the neck and just the, the demand of Dream Theater's riffs, but it just looks cool. I like watching guys like Sean Malone play because I'm impressed by the their ability to be so efficient, but this looks more cool to me because it's like I can kind of see the riff in action a lot more viscerally, you know? I mean, just look at, just look at the way his fingers are kind of flying there. His fretting hand especially. James on that tambo. <laughs> Obviously, insane solos. Woo. Look at that multi finger raking there with my young. It zoomed in for a second. You can kind of see. Rake with the ring over two or three strings, rake with the middle, come down, rake again. And I'm assuming he's doing that same riff. I'm going to shout out Connor Green from Haken, who actually played this song with Mike Portnoy in his like kind of reunion, AA Sweet Saga tour, a couple shows they did. There's a video of him on Instagram. I'm going to show a clip of it right here. But the way he plays and rakes that technique is something I want to learn to make it look that smooth. I almost thought that video was in slow motion when he first posted this. But now that I can see this live video, my young is kind of doing the same technique. So it basically involves playing that riff, which is. That kind of thing. But you're doing rake with the ring, rake with the middle, rake with the index. So then it looks like this. Getting that fast and to kind of make it all sync up is really interesting, but I'm really glad to see my young kind of doing that same technique here. Effortless. Does he know what county's on? And Mike Portmoy's showmanship. Best in the biz. Let me go back there. So if that's kind of the same riff as that bass break I was talking about earlier with the tapping, it looks like he maybe wasn't tapping it live. You kind of see his, he's fretting it here. Doesn't look like he was tapping it. This is such a gurgly riff. Woo! 
Check out that Mike Portnoy fill. Another one of those tasty things Portnoy only can do so good. A little triplet thrown in. Doodly doodly ka 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 ka. Love that Portnoy stuff. It's great. Non stop. Man, those th- those kind of riffs that are just going between two notes with like a one and two over here, those are just so annoying to play. This that sounds like an annoyingly hard riff. And I always thought this was the hardest riff of the song, but you had to do this a past eleven minutes and forty two seconds of technicality to get here. Just m- blows my mind. Blows my mind. Half time in this now. Mm, listen to that bass tone. God, that just sounds exhausting. Oh, that was cool. Okay, listen to this riff. I want you to just zone in on the riff, the notes, the way they move. Listen. That is a variation on that intro, which I didn't even really notice. This is kind of the... Really, really cool. You know, Dream Theater is so good at kind of bringing out back those familiar things where when you hear it, you're like, there's a sense of familiarity with it, and it kind of ties the whole song together. They're just masters at kind of bringing back the motifs, and sometimes they'll do it on three tracks later in an album. And those are those little Easter eggs and nuggets that this band has always sucked me back in with and just kind of, you know, you listen to a Dream Theater song 50 times, and on the 51st listen, you hear something you hadn't heard before. Just one of my favorite things about this band, truly is. I'm going to go back and catch that whole outro section there. a cool live edit. It follows the flow of the intro. Super cool. So good. Man. Man, just love this era of that band. So good. Thank you guys for recommending The Glass Prison. I think Learning to Live was second place, so that will probably be the next one a little bit down the line. At face value, this track is an onslaught. It's the first start of the Alcoholics Anonymous suite Mike Portnoy wrote. It's a strong intro to such a heavy album. Thank you guys so much for sticking with this long-winded video. This is a long song, and I wanted to really do it some justice and talk about the things in the song that stand out to me and are so exciting. And comment what other bands you'd like to see and what other bass players you'd like to see. And please give me a subscribe. I look forward to chatting with you guys in the comments about it. And we will see you next time. Cheers.